Hello, everybody. This is Dory Clark, and we're here with our weekly Newsweek interview show, Better, where we talk to authors, business executives, entrepreneurs, and leaders about strategies for making your life better. And our goal, our guest this week is my homeboy, John Hall. John is the co-founder of Calendar.com. He is the author of the book, Top of Mind. And we're going to be talking about how to make a lasting impression on your audience, how to stay top of mind, and how to build relationships built on trust. John Hall, great to have you here. Thank you for having me. I, I love joining in things like this with people who kind of align with the topic. And when we, some of the things we're talking about, I can't say enough about how you engage people and build trust. So uh, I think this will be fun to talk about. And you, you kind of practice what I preach here. I love it. That's great. Well, you're you're practicing what I preach because you are you are <laughs> out chillaxing right now, uh, doing doing your your live stream from uh, a gorgeous location. So we're all a little jealous of you, John. Uh, this is great. And if you are tuning in live, please feel free to type into the chat box and let us know who you are and where you are dialing in from. We'd love to hear from you and also to take your questions for John Hall. So, John, my first question, you wrote a book uh, a while back called Top of Mind. Now, we all know that these days we are just subjected to almost endless amounts of noise, of people competing for our attention. What is it that that we need to know if you're if you're a person, if you're a company, about how you actually can begin to break through some of the the noise? What's uh, what are the the main things that people need to be aware of in this incredibly crowded marketplace? Yeah, so the most important thing is that from the top, like the leadership kind of buys into this mindset of engaging others because leaders can be very focused. Actually, I was uh, on the phone with the CEO yesterday that was just money, 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 uh, ROI and things like that. And so for me, that stuff is very, very important. But a lot of times they're short term um, ways of thinking when in reality, the best brands that I see have a, a natural balance between making money, ROI and building trust and brand. And so when I'm thinking about when I'm going into like talking to a CEO and I'm like, Hey, what are the goals? Let's, let's get the money out of the way first. And let's talk about these, these very high up uh, goals. Cause I don't, I want to put quantitative metrics at, at the beginning, but then you got to look at is that um, how can we hit these metrics while also building trust and engaging others? Um, especially right now, there's a lack of trust. I've been talking about this for the last two to three years is that you have media issues. You have uh, political issues with trust. You have generational issues with trust. So the first step is getting leadership to buy in and say, look, we value this audience. We want to engage them in a meaningful way. And we're going to align that with our quantitative metrics so that over time we are looked at as that trusted resource. So at first, it's the mindset, the strategy at the top, because that filters down throughout your whole company. Um, and and if the leaders are doing that, it, it's, it's a wildfire uh, of like greatness of how you engage others. That's a great point. Thank you very much. We're here with John Hall. He's the author of the book, Top of Mind. Now, John, one of the other hats that you wear, you're a bit of a renaissance man, is you're the co-founder of Calendar.com. I know you've spent a lot of time thinking about, about you know, literally our calendars and how that factors into productivity choices that we're making and how we can best align our life with our priorities. I would love to, to actually hear more, you know, here, here you are with your beautiful vista behind you. What do your average days look like? And how do you personally, as someone who has clearly expended a lot of time and effort thinking about how to lay out your own calendar, how do you think about time management? Yeah, it's funny when people ask me, because we're involved, I have a holding company that's involved in a lot of different things. And people are like, oh, so you're involved in this, you have your hands here. And I'm like, it's actually more aligned than you think. Because when you look at my past company, uh, like I, uh, Ico was a, a company I uh, sold in the past. It was about, um, you know, creating trust through byline content um, and uh, expertise. And then uh, for me, that's a part of engagement. And then when I got involved with Calendar, for me, the, one of the biggest reasons why uh, trust and, and uh, engaging people is that there's a barrier is, is time. And I, and I think, I don't know if I, I even told you this story, Dory, before we uh, acquired Calend or the domain and, and built that out, we were going to build a relationship software that was basically called like top of mind. You know, it, I forgot what the actual name was, but it was a software that would help you engage people that were important to your company and your life in you know, meaningful ways. Uh, and we started developing it. And one of the biggest barriers we had was time. 
people want to be the best version of themselves. I, I do believe, uh, you know, some people are down occasionally, but in reality, we want to be better and time is the biggest factor. So that's why we invested in calendar. Um, because like, for example, I didn't prioritize well. So like I would put my, like, I used to give my wife the same like scheduling opportunity with me as like an, a, a, someone who asked for advice that I don't even know. That is a messed up thing where now it's like, I naturally like when we were building out calendar, it was like, Hey, we want a variety of slots that you can pick one that was for your, you know, your spouse or partner, another one that's for your uh, close coworkers, another one that's for uh, potential sales leads. And then also like I mentor a lot. And so then I have a mentor uh, ship link now, granted, I love mentorship, but it can't be a priority. Like I have to put my wife, my business before these things. So then it allowed uh, us to do different kind of scheduling links so that we could naturally prioritize our time. So for me, everything's connected to engaging um, people, being top of mind, and actually using your time in the best way so that you can do that. Because for me, business is the best, absolute best, when you are not only doing something you care about, but also engaging the people that you, you want to spend time. Like when you look at happiness, I think happiness around a company and a person is um, very influenced by the community that surrounds them and how people look at them and engage them. And so I love having that as an aspect of business, but once again, aligned with business goals. And so I think the more you actually do this stuff, you'll see that people come to you a lot more to do business deals for business opportunity because people are naturally a magnet to people they like similar to you and I. There's a lot of people that do similar stuff that, that you do, but I, I check in with you more than them because you're more engaging to me. So uh, I think that that's a, a key factor in not only being successful in business, but also being happy as well. I love it. And, and thank you very much. I'm Dory Clark. I'm here with John Hall. He's the author of the book, Top of Mind. We're talking about how to make a lasting impression and build relationships with your audience. If you are enjoying this conversation, you can check out John's book. Again, it's called Top of Mind. And you can make sure you never miss one of our weekly Newsweek Better shows. Just go to doryclark.com slash LI for LinkedIn. You can follow me there, subscribe to the LinkedIn newsletter, and you'll get reminders about these conversations. So, I also want to say hi to some of the great folks who are tuning in from around the world to join us. We want to say hi to our frequent guest, Cheryl from Minneapolis, St. Paul. We've got Rita Marie from Ireland. We've got Melanie from Raleigh. Carlos from Colombia. Bridget's here from San Mateo. We have a LinkedIn friend from California. Dennis from London. Alicia from Oakland. Caroline from London. Nisha from Boston. Meg from Woodstock, Vermont. Southern New Hampshire in the house. Miami, Fort Lauderdale. Annette is here from Salisbury, Maryland. Man Manuel is here from Guadalajara. And Linda from Nigeria. We love having every single one of you. We're glad to have you here and have this conversation with John Hall. Now, John, a question that I have, you're talking about uh, building connections based on trust, a question that comes up a lot in the business world. And it's it's a little uh, controversial, I guess you could say, because you have you have the pro authenticity camp, and then you have the I'm going to vomit if I hear the word authenticity uh, camp. So where do you fall in this? How do we think about authenticity when it comes to building trust based relationships? Well, it, it's uh, the realness matters. So authenticity, it, the fun, funny thing about that is, uh, is that people like throwing out there as like an advertising campaign where authenticity isn't like advertising. Authenticity is who being real and the best version and the real versions of yourself and your brand and connecting with others. So it, it's almost like when you're screaming authenticity, I actually try not to write about it as much anymore because I just try and live it and talk and naturally communicate. So, yeah, I think it comes off when when authenticity over time with a brand and with people is earned. Now, granted, um, now you can do campaigns and try and build trust quickly. And, and I've seen some success with that. But um, to me, it's, it's developing, it, it's not about a campaign. It's about actually changing behavior in a positive way that is long-term that affects the audience that matters. So like in, I can go in and tell my employees, Hey guys, all of a sudden, like be authentic with people and do this. And you might see some short term, but without actually creating long-term habits of caring, like for example, doing things like personalized notes in our office, doing things where we're in, um, where we are checking in on people when they have important things that like, that's real. That's like real processes where it's not just like, Hey, I heard it was her birthday, you know, do it. Like you're actually saying we care about this audience. 
So, and let's not do it for like, hey, by the way, here's a, here's a, like a giftology is a good book um, that I, that is written by a friend of mine where John or John Rowland talks about like, don't like give something thoughtful and immediately be like, hey, so like I need a sell. So like, can you, do you have any referrals? It's like, that's, <laughs> that's authenticity campaigns <laughs> and uh, trust building campaigns that are just naturally, uh, you know, they, they don't, they actually can hurt trust. So for me, it's about the realness, uh, creating long-term processes. Uh, in play and also turning into who you are like something that I talk about in like my uh, keynotes is a little different than the average business speaker because I talk about how you are at home now some people are like why are you talking about how I am with my spouse or my partner or my friends and I'm like well the reason why I want you to become better there is because it, the the better you are at home and with those uh, personal relationships the better you are in the office uh, I have a couple friends that have really bad difficult marriages and that bleeds into the uh, office and or they have a relationship that bleeds in the office. And so I, I really try and say, hey, guys, here are examples how overall you can not just act and be a campaign and that you can actually naturally engage people in this way at home at, you know, like at not just the office, because if you're like that in other areas of your light, it's not a light switch. It's not like, oh, I'm on, off, on, off. Um, it's actually who you are. And so I think the more you uh, can do that, the more it truly is authentic. Uh, and, um, and, yeah, and, and then it's not just looked at as something that you try to do to get a, to, to get short-term trust or to, to get a sale or of some sort. Yeah, that's so interesting. Thank you very much. We're here with John Hall. He's the author of the book, Top of Mind. And if you're enjoying this conversation, hit the like button, hit the share button so that your friends can benefit from it as well. And please feel free to type into the chat box. Let us know your questions for John Hall. We're talking marketing. We're talking uh, how to make an impression on your audience and build trust-based relationships. We also want to say hi to our amazing friends. Deborah's here from Los Angeles. Diana from Columbia, South Carolina. Faiz is here from UAE. Zeke from San Benito. Texas. Monica's in the house from Boston. Francis from Accra. We've got uh, Yasmina from Paris. We've got Cliff from Waterdown, Ontario. Hetty is here. We've got Mohammed from uh, or Bima from uh, Georgia. We've got Cheryl from Kearney, Nebraska, and Mario from Redondo Beach. We love having every single one of you here. And John, a question that I have: You also one of you know one of the the things you've also done over the years is really built up a lot of expertise when it comes to SEO, when it comes to social media. This is a moment where I, I think we have a, a lot of countervailing trends. There's plenty of professionals who feel a little sick of social media. They don't necessarily want to engage, but feel like they have to. Um, meanwhile, there's there's so many different channels that people sometimes wonder, do I have to be on all of them? How do I be thinking about this? When it comes to our brands online and building relationships and getting your name known online, how are you thinking about that these days? What would you advise the average professional? Yeah, so I'm biased in this, obviously. My last like 10, 15 years of my life have been around, um, you know, my last company, current companies I invest with are all around, um, you know, this investment in your, your personal and professional and, you know, general company brands. So I'm very biased. And I think that uh, it's, it's such a good investment in the long term um, and short term. So, uh, for example, after I sold my last company, um, one of the first things we did was we looked at start uh, a company. Like I ended up um, investing in a company called Relevance.com or ad advising a company called Relevance.com. And what I liked about them was um, they were using these t uh, these uh, kind of services to invest in companies as well. Because and and that's why like I've started investing in the company that they service because I know that. If you have a company with a good product, with good people, uh, if ultimately you market it and build a brand that's that's protected and then you, you develop a lead generation uh, funnel, you're going to win. It's just like it's rocket. It's not rocket science to me. It's like people like I love people first companies. I first look at that. And I'm like, oh, that's awesome. Uh, next one, you know, the next one you, you kind of look at is, OK, product services where that's at. People are like, wait a minute, you look at the people for the product. I'm like, yeah, when I'm investing, I absolutely do that. And then you look at, uh, you know, the, the product and service and you ultimately look at that and you say, OK, now that we have, you know, good product, service, good people, then let's let's look at what we're doing to be a catalyst to their brand to uh, develop this trust. Um, and uh, so that's where I like I believe in it so much. As soon as I like my last three years of my life is investing in companies that see that and it pays off really, really well. And that's why I got involved with Relevance.com as the advisor. 
And so what I would tell everyone here is that, you know, it just it, you don't have to do things overnight. Like uh, the best uh, things are long term planning and, and making short term goals of progress. So like when someone's like, oh, you know, should I be like I was just asked yesterday, it's like, how how often should I be involved in LinkedIn? Well, for me, I'm like, okay, first off, the question is, who's your audience? And they're like, okay, this, are they on LinkedIn? Do you know they're on LinkedIn? It's like, yes. Okay, great. We, we got that. Uh, I see that very constant where everybody's like spreading their social channels where they're like, well, I should be on TikTok. I'm like, your audience is not remotely, you, you're serving farmers. Farmers are not a big TikTok user. And so I think that that's the first thing you look at is that what's the platforms that I should and actually invest in one more th that has that audience and yes maybe do minimal things on the other one so it's just active accounts um because you want that natural uh showing up for rep management and just an ongoing account if people check them out but um but once you find it out then invest in it and do it right and scale it uh when people ask me about my linkedin newsletter it's gotten up to i think three hundred sixty thousand followers that, that my message goes in their inbox well that started off at 500 it's not like i just was like Oh, by the way, I, I here's 350,000 people that just want to listen to me. Uh, that's not the case. You have to work hard, especially me. Uh, you know, so I look at that and I'm like, uh, you know, it, it's an overtime investment. And then also, um, you know, just set, I, I would say, quarterly goals on the progress that you want to uh, make. And um, also try and align it both with your personal and, and brand goals. Uh, a lot of times, like for my companies uh, or when I'm talking to one of like, uh, you know, client we're advising, I'm like, hey, uh, invest in your people and hopefully you get in a, a situation where you not only invest in the, the people uh, or in yourself, but also the brand and you align those things because then you both win. Let's say a company gets acquired. You have a personal brand that's kind of, you know, growing some credibility as well. So I'm a very big fan of um, one, identifying the audience, making sure you're going after the right platform Two, um, consistency. Um, and then, um, you know, three aligning that content so that you get as much, uh, almost look at it as an orange and squeeze that, the juice as much. So there's legitimately no pulp or, or juice left in that. And what that means is, you know, are you aligning strategies? Um, are you, uh, you know, uh, like, for example, when I write for a Forbes or an Inc or a fast company, I'm resyndicating that on my LinkedIn news newsletter uh, weeks after and I'm crediting that original site. Those are things that are simple social things you can do that are very low effort, but but actually maximize the value and align the content. Love that. We are here with John Hall, who is the author of the book Top of Mind. I'm Dory Clark, and this is Better, a weekly Newsweek interview show that is every Thursday at noon Eastern, 9 Pacific, 5 o'clock in London. We want to say hi to Vijaya Kumar, who's joining us from Chennai. We've got Celeste from South Africa. Priscilla's here from Mexico. Jeanette from Chile. We've got Elen joining us. Adnan from Turkey. We've got Engi from the Philippines. Uh, Ananda from Bangalore. We've got Lainey from Chicago. Mohammed from Egypt. Karen from Phoenix. Anna from beautiful Vancouver. Eduardo is here from Portugal. We've got Nicole from the Gold Coast of Queensland, Australia, and F.A. from Accra. Uh, we love having all of you here. So a great question, John, came in uh, for you from Hetty in Philadelphia. And Hetty wants to know, what in your experience is the best type of high quality content to get top of mind? We all know there, there's a lot of low quality content out there. That's not going to do the trick. But what, what would be your definition of high quality content? And do you have tips for people about how we should be thinking about it and creating it? Yeah, uh, whatever helps you accomplish your goal. Uh, as silly as that is, is that uh, my answer has changed over time. If you even see me speak three to 10 years ago, it's going to be like, here's what high quality content is. It has changed dramatically because there is so much content. And also content is very subjective, very subjective. Like we we are uh, have relationships with a lot of media outlets that we're consistently getting things placed in. And we will send something to one outlet that they'll be like, this is garbage, terrible stuff. And you're like, oh, wow, I thought it was okay. Then you send it to someone else. They're like, this is amazing. We're putting it live. And then it goes viral. Um, and that's what I would tell you is that like we, we view high quality from our eyes, but our eyes don't really matter. Uh, it, what matters is the audience that people are trying to engage in. And does it help you accomplish the goal you're trying to go after? So like instead of thinking, hey, by the way, I'm going to send this to an editor. And uh, like, I'll give you an example. There's an editor and writer that's on our team or that is a contracted one that I think content is garbage. Honestly, I'm just like, this is not good. 
And then there's one that's so well, she spends a ton of time on it. I read it, I'm like, God, that's engaging content. That's awesome. We send those articles out. One really wins on views and engagement and impressions and the other one doesn't, but the, for the right people, that other one does. Uh, so like the one that is the high quality, in my opinion, a small group of people, awesome content. They love it. However, not many people share and see that. So if you're going after a niche audience, that one makes a lot of sense. Uh, we were talking to a client the other day that has 200 people in the U.S. that they're trying to target. That's all. 200 people. Well, you, yeah, you better have some high quality content that is exactly what I just described. That's stuff that I really, really like. However, we have another client that um, uh, or we have a, a I'll just close. This one is Gab Wireless, which love the it's one of my favorite companies out there because it develops basically safe phones and technology for um, children. Uh, I never thought I'd get my kids a phone and a watch and but I ended up doing it uh, because uh, I believe that it's uh, it's uh, the, the future is providing safe technology for kids. And so I love this company. Uh, but for them, it, they need to get as many engaging views as possible. So that other writer that I described that I don't necessarily – garbage is – it's not garbage. I'm being a little, little dramatic here. It's more, let's say, on a scale of 1 to 10. One writes, in my opinion, at a 5, and one writes at a 9. Well, the 9 typically does really well in those niche audiences. The 5 is good. And if I send that to someone else on my staff, they're like, oh, this is great. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, that's so weird to me. And so um, I tend to say – Hey, when you're going after smaller audiences, go after more, you know, detailed examples, in-depth pieces and things like that, because that's what's going to engage those people the most uh, for targeted pieces. Now, if you're in Gab's point of view, they have a massive audience. Like it's their audience is, you know, who has kids or who has who are parents that care about their kids. That's a lot. <laughs> and so for for them, it's about, you know, reaching the people that are going to enjoy the read. They're not going to need this in-depth dive. And so. I think that those are very, what I just gave you is very clear examples of how it can change on the level of quality, what you're writing, how you're engaging people um, and the, and the different you know goals you have. Yeah, such a good point. We're here with John Hall. He is the author of the book, Top of Mind. If you're enjoying the conversation, hit the like and share button so that everyone you know can benefit as well. You are, you are doing a mitzvah by sharing. And we also want to say hi to all of our great friends tuning in from around the world. We want to say hi to Ozan from Turkey. Zulima's here from Mexico. We have Annette from Southern California. We've got uh, well, let's see. We've got Jennifer from Carson, California. Sushma's in the house from India. We have uh, a, fr a LinkedIn friend from Italy and many more. And John, Annette has a great question. She is curious about your thoughts. She wants to know, how do you actually tell the difference between companies that say they put people first and the ones who actually do it? How, how can we tease that out? Everyone wants to claim that this is their value not everyone actually is walking the talk. What are your thoughts? Well, if you're dealing with them, it's very easy uh, to see across the company. There is a uh, 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 off, or there was an example of this where I was on a, a video call the other day, and I and we were potentially going to have a partnership. Well, there was these people that showed up, three or four on the team that were really like nice. They showed up, their their executive showed up, and then all of a sudden, everybody's quiet, stiff. And like, so I can tell by how a team interacts with each other right off the bat, you can just tell like, and I'm saying if it's like a partnership or like a sale or something like that, I like asking for multiple people to be on a call, how they interact. You can definitely tell what their culture really is in a first call. And on that call, when you saw, um, when I saw that, what it showed me is leadership does not really focus on culture very much, but they seem to like each other and they probably are against leadership a bit because you can tell they're just peas and carrots getting along well. If leader shows up, they're quiet, they're walking on eggshells, not happy. And so like there's certain things that you can read about a company when you're interacting with them or like with their content, you can kind of tell. Uh, as you're, you know, reading and looking into them, that there's like a lot of hypocrisy where it's like, you know, this they do they write about this but do this. Um, yeah, like I can um, tell, like especially with individuals, there's a lot of authors. You're 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 one. I actually, I would say in the minority are people that practice what they preach. Um, I know someone who wrote a, one of the best, well, well-known relationship books out there on the planet, and is terrible to people. So it's like for me. I'm like, wow, that's awkward uh, that you actually, and I've seen behind, when we get off stage, I see how they treat people. And I'm like, that is not how you should treat people. And so uh, I think that, um, I think for me, it's just always walking in this situation, self-aware of that and, or like being aware of that and saying, Hey, 
uh, in reality, um, trust is earned. And I'm looking at the obvious natural things that are real signals and not a piece of, not just a piece of content. Content is a great way to nurture people and also initially kind of touch base with them um, at first. And so uh, to me, it's, it's more of a thing where um, you can, you look at the real situations rather than just reading a piece of content, but content plays a very uh, big part of nurturing and, and engaging people as well. It's just one part to me. Um, and so that's why I think that it, uh, you just kind of look at the, holistically those real situations and kind of uh, read it from there. By the way, thanks a lot. Like, I love these comments. And like, a lot of times I jump on things and people don't comment. Like, I love this story. Like, I was just and these are actually like thoughtful, like, hey, what does this mean? And so uh, props to you for like building an audience here. It, it excites me uh, to see this. So you you all I know, Naman and Angela and uh, Annette, there's just a lot of questions coming feel free, you know, we run out of time here to message me directly on LinkedIn and connect with the, um, uh, connect with me uh, so that uh, I can answer those. Cause I know we're not going to be able to get to anybody, but I do value, you guys are spending time listening to me uh, chat. So I'll, I'll spend some time trying to uh, engage with you. So I just wanted to say that uh, before we get off. That's fantastic. Thank you. And even Philip the cat is tuning in. So uh, that's, uh, that's positive. <laughs> so, uh, so we, we are very grateful for all of you who are tuning in and asking your great questions. We want to say hi to Fartoon from Windsor, uh, Canada. We've got Doreen in the house from Ohio. Mariana is from Chicago. Henry's from South Africa. Blessing is joining us. Angela from North Carolina and DC. Gabriel is here from Mexico uh, and many more, including Arinola from Nigeria. And John, a great question came in from our friend Adnan in Turkey. Now, Adnan has, uh, has a concern that I think probably a lot of people share and says, investing in myself and trying to have a brand is a little weird because I'm a person and not a company or a product. How do I deal with the inner critic around personal branding or self-promotion? What would, what would you say to that? Oh, it's one of my favorite uh, signs that somebody is like a, a good, uh, humble and non-egotistical person. Uh, and, but, uh, and so I, I like that is that like, I love how that's a concern, but you have to get over it. And what I mean by getting over it is that you look at it as you are a vehicle for your success and, and your company and future company success. You are a, um, you know, think of it as a car. You want to get, you know, uh, you know, the, a better engine, a better, you know, thing because you're, you're basically driving things a lot of times to success and also a company success. Your own success is around that brand, um, your, your own education, how you're perceived, your relationships. And so uh, to me, that is a great thing. I first, I admire it when people say it to me, but I immediately cut it off. I'm like, thank you for sharing that with me. I like your humbleness and I like how you care. However, we've got to throw that out the window because w there's a couple things. One, I'm very passionate about getting people that are uh, humble, engaging, that actually aren't ego egotistical uh, maniacs out there, out there. Because the problem is, is that this next generation, if they're only led by people that are visibly egotistical and they're just like, I'm awesome, go buy a Mercedes and show people how rich I am by this Mercedes or helicopter, then this next generation, we're going to be screwed, honestly, by, you know, that leadership. I was blessed to have a generation above me that worked hard, that engaged uh, people in ways that was, uh, was amazing and cared about others. And I think we have to look and we have to say, hey, like, so, um, you know, for those of you who might have that barrier, one, as a good, good person that has experiences that you can share with that with people, you should want to do that to be you know helpful. And also, you're the right, you're typically the right person to do it because you have that bird, you have that barrier of humbleness with you, which is a, a great uh, sign. Then the next thing is, if you do that, you're going to miss out on opportunities to lead, to lead your company. Like I'll give you an example. There was a company recently that was like, "Well, we're doing fine. We've had 15% year over year growth, so I don't need to do that." And I'm like. Okay, well, that is, that's a wrong way of looking at it. And they're, I'm like, I'm excited about your growth. I think that's great. But you don't know that could have been 20. That could have been 25%. That could have been 30. Because I do know companies in your area that are growing at that rate. And, and they're like, oh, well, well, what do you mean? I'm like, you can't look at it as we're doing good. So we don't have to do that. What you have to do is you have to put, you have to, as a leader, as a, you know, someone at the company, if you truly care about the success, you have to say, what are we doing to, to have the optimal amount of success that we truly can put in things in place so that we actually get it. And that's why a lot of times people, you know, they, they, 
look at success and they say, hey, I've seen some success. I don't necessarily need to do that. Or, uh, But in reality, uh, the best companies, if you look, have an element of thought leadership. They invest in their brand. Um, the uh, What's nice about, uh, the, I see a lot of the companies that Relevance takes on. And when I look at what the, the types of businesses they bring, the, the leaders are like that. And I love that about them because they do care. They like tend to be less egotistical ones. But if you do it the right way and earn it. So that's what I'm very big on is like earning the, and not like trying to hack it, not trying to be showy. And what I mean by earning is it's like, like consistency over time, building followers that trust you, um, you know, being a- engaging in a way where you're, you're not losing that trust. Like you're not, you know, going there and misleading them just for, you know, dollars. You're trying to align your dollars with their trust over time. And so, um, you know, investing and protecting your brand from a standpoint of right now, we have a lot of haters out there. There, It doesn't matter. Even the Dory Clarks and the nice people of the world are going to have haters. And um, and what you have to do is you have to be proactive with your rep management. And um, part of doing that is investing in your own brand. So if somebody down the road bashes your company or your brand in some way, you want to be a force because Google and uh, search engines do look at your brand as a credible force and they're going to start valuing when you're involved in things like uh, one of the things we're starting to recommend is on your site you know have different experts contributing and also you know their profiles like i'll probably ask dory to log on a relevance or a calendar site or something in the future because you know her brand brings credibility to um a brand and that's valuable and i think that's the future is that um things like google and uh online marketing they they there's so much uh, lack, there's so much of a lack of trust there that when you involve people that are credible and you uh, and like have that kind of built up investment, then you become this force together and your companies that you're involved in are going to succeed more. So I, in short, if, if I have a couple sentences, I appreciate the question because it shows the type of person. But now you have to get over that barrier and be a true uh, engine and vehicle for the things you get involved in. And so you got to get past that and realize that you're you're doing it for the right reasons. Wonderful answer. Thank you so much. We've been here with John Hall. He is the author of the book, Top of Mind. We want to say thanks to everyone tuning in from around the world to join us, including but not limited to Sophia from Uruguay, Marcos from Brazil, and a LinkedIn friend from Barbados. We love having you every Thursday, noon noon Eastern, nine Pacific. And John Hall, what is the best way for people who are intrigued by you and your work to find you and get in touch? I mean, really, uh, I'm not too hard to, to like, I, like I said, I practice what I preach. I want to want to make sure that people can follow and engage me. So, I mean, if they want to connect on LinkedIn, just say, hey, I'm from Dory's thing. And, you know, I'll, I'll connect and try and respond. If uh, you're checking out some of the things when it comes to trust with like the PR, the SEO stuff, I we I write uh, for Relevance uh, now, and that's a company I advise, so relevance.com. If it's about productivity or time management, scheduling, uh, calendar.com, or pick up the book, uh, Top of Mind. Um, or, I mean, I'm speaking less and less these days, but if, you know, the company, if companies do look for speakers, I will uh, occasionally, if it's from one of these things, I'll, st- I'll you know, commit to it. But um, those are pretty much the common ways uh, to, to get in touch with me. Fantastic. John Hall, thank you so much. And thank you to everyone joining us this week. Take care, everyone. Thanks, Corey.